Hi guys, so today's video is a little different for my channel, but I thought it would be kind of fun and I pulled you guys out of my community tab to kind of ask you what you thought about this video idea and I got really resounding uh, response that you guys really liked this style of video and it's one that I've seen Emily Noel do and then a few other channels. Um, Emily's kind of the creator of this video idea and it's around the city of hot takes, which is this idea of like dissenting opinions or unpopular opinions or things that you think you uh, disagree with from the majority or things that bother you or things that annoy you. And I thought this would actually be a kind of fun way to get to know one another. And I, I don't want this to come off as like super negative or whiny or complainy in, in both my commentary back, etc. But here's the thing. We all have opinions and we all have likes and dislikes and make it preferences and things that we think look fantastic that other people don't like and vice versa. And acknowledging the fact that we all have different opinions, acknowledging the fact that there are things that drive us crazy or things that we really love, etc., is is an okay thing. I think sometimes, especially, I, I hate to say this in the beauty community, and maybe I'm just automatically throwing my first hot take out there, I think sometimes we're too sensitive. I think sometimes there is a tendency to jump on the bandwagon, and if somebody says something different than what you think, it's just pile on. And I see that a lot in comment sections, especially for larger channels. And I I like this topic because I think it's okay to have different opinions. I think it's okay to have a dissenting opinion. I think it's okay for someone to like something and somebody else to dramatically not like something. It's one of the things I actually enjoy personally about watching Will I Buy It videos because it lets me get to know the person on the other side of the camera and what they're talking about and what are their makeup preferences? What are things that they like? How is it that five different YouTubers who I all love and trust can have a different opinion on a makeup release. I'm getting a little rambly and I have a feeling this is going to be a somewhat rambly video, but I asked you guys out of my community tab to let me know your hot takes. And I got a lot of great comments. So I just kind of want to go through them and chat about them here on this video and then chat with you guys down in the comments below. And I also think it's a great way for us to get to know one another. And this is partly why I even thought to do this video because I think, you know, I talk a lot about products and I do declutters and I I talk about my beauty budget and I have a lot of topics that I talk about but when we are openly talking back and forth with each other about styles and preferences and opinions I feel like that's how you really start to get to know someone so I thought it'd be a good way for you guys to get to know me and vice versa for me to get to know you guys a little bit better as well so let's just go ahead these are in no particular order I just kind of plopped them all onto some paper here so I have them as reference so the first comment is from someone named Sophie I don't know how to say her last name or pronounce that second word um, she says I'm tired of of hard to recycle and wasteful packaging, especially when it comes to brushes and applicators that come with eyeshadow palettes, blushes, and bronzers. Okay, I have to agree with you here, Sophie. I am not a fan of packaging that includes brushes, applicators, anything. I find that the packaging is more bulky. I find that I never use the applicators that come in there. I don't need Anastasia to include a brush every time she releases a palette. Just take that out, make the palette a little thinner, and save some money and knock the price down a little bit for us. The thing that I was thinking about when I read your comment was I would love to see places like Sephora and Ulta step up with recycling programs. You know, so I found my very first iPhone. <laughs> crazily enough, in an old box under a bed as I was doing some cleaning in my house the other day. I have no idea why I still had it, but I did. And I realized, and I remembered rather, that Best Buy has a recycling program. When you go into their store, there are recycling bins for different electronics where you can drop it off and they will take care of dismantling and recycling as much of that electronic device as possible. And I thought to myself, there should really be a program to do that for makeup. It, it seems very complicated to dismantle it all, but if they can do that with electronics, why couldn't they do it with makeup? So I, I would love to see a Sephora or an Ulta or even a major department store like Nordstrom or Macy's step forward and figure out a program to collect that up for us. So MazD Brom, I think I'm saying that right, said, is it me or are brands releasing too many products with little time in between each new product? 
personally like it better when companies take their time curating new products that can be revolutionary in the beauty industry rather than companies who are throwing out product after product to consumers in such a short period of time. Uh, yes. Can we just say yes to this? I completely agree. In fact, the brands that I am more attracted to are ones who are doing that, who are curating smaller collections, who are being a little more thoughtful. And, and there was a comment later on, and I and I agree with this as well, and I think they kind of linked together. It was from Kimberly Poirier. Poirier? Poirier? I'm probably saying that wrong. Sorry, Kimberly. Brands are continuing the fast fashion approach to releases because people are buying. If we want to slow this down, we need to be more mindful of what we are purchasing. She then that's into sort of um, video content, which we will talk about here a little bit later. But, you know, so I don't disagree with you. I get a little overwhelmed with release after release after release. And it, it we, makeup fatigue is a real thing. I mean, think, I think we're all talking about it. I think part of the rise of popularity of channels that are focused on minimalism and smaller collections um, and, you know, this whole idea of a no buy year or a low buy year, like this whole idea has gained traction in large part because I think of makeup fatigue is real for a good portion of people. But I also appreciate the business side of what's happening behind the scenes. And that has large part to do with the influx of investor money into this industry. So the beauty industry has had massive growth and massive successful growth for years and years and years. And that kind of rapid growth within a sector attracts investors. Uh, they attract investors who are looking to make money. And so for a lot of companies, one of two things is happening. Either they're getting an influx of investor cash or they're getting purchased by a larger conglomerate. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tangent on you guys here a little bit and talk business. So apologies if this gets really boring and not about makeup, but I just want to give you sort of a business perspective of what's happening here because I see this a different industry, but I see a similar thing taking effect inside of the pet industry, which is the business area in which I work as my day job. And so I I see a similar pattern happening in the beauty side, and I and I understand what's going on, at least I think I understand what's going on. So investors are very attracted to this rapid growth industry, but investors are looking to recoup their money. They not only want to loan you and give you that money, but they want to see a fairly large return on investment. And most investment groups are looking for a massive return on investment within five years. That's very short. And so if you are taking money from investors in order to grow your business, you have a new pressure weighing on you because that money came with a caveat, which is, I have this plan, I can grow my business by this much, so I can not only pay you back investors, but you can make a whole bunch of money off of me in five years or less. On the flip side, you know, we've talked about this, I think, for the last several years, you know, brands continue to get purchased by larger mega corporations like Cody, like L'Oreal. So let's just use Too Faced as an example. Um, they were recently sold, I think, to Estee Lauder, maybe a couple years ago at this point. But uh, let's pretend Too Faced, before they were sold, ha was making like a billion dollars in sales. It, it might be a little high, but let's just say a billion. It makes things easy to calculate off of. So they've got a billion dollars in sales. The other thing that Too Faced is tracking internally is something called EBITDA. And EBITDA stands for earnings before taxes, interest, and amortization. And essentially what that means is how good are they operationally? How profitable can they make their company through operations, right? So it's going to cost staff, it's going to cost warehousing, it costs ingredients and packaging. It takes a whole big pile of things in order to deliver a product to a retailer in order to make money. Even a kind of measures and is a good litmus test for investors on how efficient is this company? Do they know what they're doing? Um, or do they waste a ton of money in order to make a billion dollars? Investors are paying attention to those two numbers. They're looking at a lot, but those two numbers are really in their brain when they go to purchase a company. So when you buy Too Faced and they have a billion dollars in sales, you don't buy them for a billion dollars. You don't buy them for two billion dollars. Most of the multipliers we are seeing in high growth industry brands are somewhere between four to six times and oftentimes can stretch as high as almost eight times multipliers. So that means Too Faced has a billion dollars in sales. 
the company who's buying them is probably going to have to pay $4 billion for Too Faced in order to acquire them. And now the company who's purchased them has to figure out how they make that money back. So most of these larger Estee Lauder brand companies or L'Oreal or Cody, when they go and purchase a brand like Too Faced, they have to figure out the return on investment. And most of these guys want a five-year return on investment. These brands that purchase these companies have the same ROI involved in their brain as the investment companies. The investment companies are looking for five years to double or triple their money and in their investment in the company. These big brands want to make all of their money back and start being profitable with the sale in usually about five years or less. So let's continue with our example. So Too Faced has a billion dollars in sales. They have a $500 million profit. It takes $500 million to make all their stuff, pay for their staff, warehousing, ingredients, all that jazz. So if you're Estee Lauder and you've just purchased Too Faced, you know on the books that your ROI, if all things stay equal, is going to be eight years. Why is that? Because you've just paid $4 billion for it. You are only going to get out of that company $500 million a year, and that's going to take you eight years to pay back. No one wants that kind of ROI. So if you're Estee Lauder and you've just purchased Too Faced, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to try and ramp up sales. You're going to try and grow them from a billion dollars in sales to $2 billion in sales. How are you going to do that? You are going to crank out new products. The other thing you're going to be doing is trying to lower the cost. You try and make your EBITDA number even better. You're going to try and leverage your supply chain. You're going to try and say, I'm Estee Lauder. I buy 20 tons of talc a month to make all of my Estee Lauder products, and I only pay a dollar a pound for it. You guys are paying $2 a pound because you don't buy as much. So we are going to use our buying connections to lower the cost of talc going into the products that Too Faced carries to make their margins better, to make more money out of those products. And they're going to use everything in their arsenal to try and operationalize and make them more efficient and more profitable on the back end. So they're going to be driving top, top line sales as fast as possible by launching products out the yin yang. And they're also going to be trying to reduce overhead costs on the opposite side to try and get that window from an eight year ROI back down to something around four to five. Personally, I'm not surprised to see an explosion of new products constantly coming out at us because that's what's happening. You've got investors and companies who've been purchased who are driving those brands to increase those sales and make themselves more profitable so that they can make their money back or make the money in the case of investors. And so you see that with brands like Anastasia. We know for a fact that although she wasn't sold, she got a massive influx from an investment company. So she's on that five-year track now. She has to probably show sales growth to that investment group pretty significantly over the next five years. And she's going to take that money and she's going to release a ton more products in order to do that. And she's going to do things like make products in China in order to reduce her overhead costs. We're starting to see this. We saw a Jackie Ina palette and then the ABH Norvina palette were launched on its heels. And that Norvina palette was made in China. It was a lot cheaper to manufacture. I would lay so much money on it than her normal Anastasia palettes. And she's launched palette after palette after palette this year. She used to be a brand in my mind that was more curated. Now she's got this round of money that's been sunk into her and she's having to do what these other brands have done historically in order to grow top line sales and increase her profitability. So our love of makeup and our love of color and playing and expression and the growth that we have, you know, provided this, these companies in this industry through that love and that passion has unfortunately, and I don't want to say unfortunately, but the result has been that we have created an industry that is very attractive to outside investment. And that changes the paradigm when they get involved. When outside investors move into an industry in a significant way, you experience a shift as a consumer. I just feel like I just did a really deep dive and probably half of you guys are asleep now. So apologies if that was the the world's most boring thing. But I, I wanted to share kind of a different take on why I think we're seeing this like flood of new releases, why I think we've seen a change even in the past 
three to four years in terms of this rapid fire release program. And, you know, it used to be sort of a spring fall release, and now it's just a constant flood all the time. I, I think there has been a number of factors, and I do think this is a pretty significant reason. Uh, Foster Whitaker says, I wish that when it comes to videos, there were more tutorials on the like than first impressions and reviews of new releases. I don't care much anymore about new releases because I know it won't be I won't be purchasing. Eyeshadow palettes are the most tempting for me. Me too. Uh, but I can dupe things at home well enough. And there was an echo in a couple of other comments on there where you want to see more videos of tutorials and tips and techniques and so on and so forth and less product type focused. I think I think a couple things are at play with that. One, I think there's a slew of channels that consider themselves makeup enthusiasts and not experts, right? So I think there's a pile of us who are self-taught, who are not Raw Beauty Christie's level of like detailed precision, etc., who oftentimes talk ourselves out of doing tutorial type videos because we just don't feel like we know enough because we just feel like we don't have the expertise or the makeup we do is boring. Who would want to watch that? And yet I also feel like I see channels like Mariah Leonard's where I think she's talented, but I think she does very wearable and approachable looks. And so I, I've heard the side of the story of, you know, well, I put out tutorials or I put out content full face of using old makeup and nobody watches it or my views are down. And, and that's true. I mean, when I look at a lot of the people I follow, you can see views are down on certain styles of videos versus others. And so there was a comment later on here where it said something about, you know, you vote with our clicks. And I think I've heard that echoed out there before. But I think two things. One, I think some of the times those videos are not getting the clicks because YouTube sees them as so different from our core content. So I think sometimes YouTube goes, oh, you review videos about products. And when you do a non-review type video, its algorithm is like, oh, this is different than your channel. I don't know if I'm going to recommend this tutorial style video to your audience because it's so different than your core content. So I think that it's on you guys to, to click the things that are you're passionate about, but it's kind of on us as well to kind of make it a more inclusive part of our channel because for two reasons, one, to teach that Google algorithm that my channel is this too, not just this, because uh, Mariah has done that. And Mariah, I think, is a channel that I would point to who gets kind of even clicks on her, you know, tutorials and use full face of using nothing new and talking about a style or aesthetic of makeup as well as new releases. And as a result, I think her view counts are about the same and YouTube knows what to do with her. So I think it, it makes me think that A, I need to get over my, you don't have the expertise to be talking about how to do eyeshadow. I, you can do approachable makeup. So that's on me to get past. And it's also on me to just put more of that content out to even if it gets less views and hopefully teach the YouTube algorithm to show that to more people. I'm hypothesizing on that second part. I don't know that to be a fact for a YouTube algorithm, but I, I agree. I think there's things that we can do as a community, I can do as a content creator, as well as things you can do to kind of vote with your clicks for content like you're describing here. Oh, Laura, Laura Prince, you and I are about to get into some trouble here. Okay. Multi-chromes are ugly and most of the time it looks like your eyes don't even match and you made a patchy colorful mess, unless used very sparingly. I know that multi-chromes are all the rage right now and I will stare f for longer than is healthy at a swatch of a multi-chrome going back and forth over the top of someone's hand and it like switching like five different colors because it's like a quad tro chrome or a trichrome. I get how satisfying it is to look at on hands but I'm kind of with Laura. I don't like how it looks on the eyes. And I say that with the giant asterisks because I'm duochrome obsessed. I love pink. I love the blue brown shifts. I love the, um, the pinky blue shifts or the purple blue shifts. Like I have a lot of duochromes in my collection that I love, but I've tried a trichrome and I absolutely did not care for how it looked on my eyes. I kind of felt like the same way. It kind of, I felt for me, it felt like I had applied three eyeshadows and they didn't go to well, go well together. And then as I was turning my eyes, it was like, 
I don't know. I, I just didn't care for the effect on me. So this is a makeup preference. I know my friend Hannah Louise Poston, if you're watching this, is gasping and dying a little slow death over there because that is her life. And I know, I mean, clearly I'm in the minority here because like that seems to be like the thing that everybody is loving. And heck, Lisa Eldridge just even posted a tutorial showing a trichrome on her channel this last week. And I was like, oh, even Lisa's in on it. So I just, I personally don't like it as I've put it on myself because I just feel like it's, it looks haphazard. And I don't need everything to be super precise. In fact, I actually prefer a more blown out eye. I prefer things that are a little softer and a little more blended. I'm not in this like you can only apply eyeshadow in one particular way camp, but I also just don't like these trichrome, multi-chrome things on my eyes. I, I don't, I don't like how they look. RK17 says, beauty YouTubers destroyed their own fans trust with them to gain free product. I feel like smaller YouTubers have begun to fix that. The only way to do that is to acknowledge and address it in a way that is not negative. So I, I get where you're coming from here. I also um, got to a point with channels and I'm not going to name names here, but I got to a point with channels where I, um, I had a hard time, like an opinion started to form about them and I had a hard time removing that filter about them because of all the affiliates and the sponsorships. And there was just some untrustworthy things that I kind of felt were happening. And I had to kind of back away from those channels because I couldn't it's like you can't unsee it, right? You can't unthink it. It's in your brain at that point. Um, but I also feel like sponsorship and affiliate codes inside of the beauty space, I feel like they're really different than a lot of other categories. When I think of podcasts, when I think of the tech groups that I follow on YouTube, when I think of the booktubers that I follow. What's interesting, and I'm going to talk about this through the lens of a podcast because I feel like it's a similar style for the other kinds of genres I just notated there. When they do a sponsored video, it's like a quick advertisement in the beginning of their video to say, Today's content is sponsored by audiobooks, Amazon, yada, yada, yada. I'm gonna read this little script and we're gonna talk about why I like it real quickly and then we move into our content and we're done. And what's interesting to me about that is a lot of that content is topical, right? So when I'm turning into a tech YouTuber, I'm doing that to learn a new skill set. I'm learning um, Premiere Pro, or I'm learning how to be a better photo editor, or I'm learning uh, about a story. In most cases, all of those things that I've just talked about there are not about products. Once I get past that sponsorship at the very beginning, the content that I'm then subsequently listening to and are watching is not typically about a product, it's about a, it's a, it's teaching me something, right? What What's different about the beauty community is that the sponsorship are often linked to product and product placement, which is what our pr content is also about. Our content is about products and our content is about new releases or reviews or using old products or things we love or application techniques also using products and so, it, to me, I think why it feels different in the beauty community when we see sponsored content is, is that it's just more closely connected to the content that then comes after that's not sponsored. And that starts to feel a little strange in a way that some of those other genres just don't. Here's the thing, I definitely think, and we know this for a fact, that there was you know, a, a period of time several years ago where, you know, it was the wild, wild west. No one was disclosing anything. Very few people were disclosing anything. And it caused a lot of mistrust to build up out there. And I think rightly so, because I think a lot of us felt scammed. We felt like, oh my gosh, they were taking money for that? I didn't know that. That came off like that was totally genuine. Do they really feel that way? And so I get this sort of hesitancy on the part of a lot of people to feel comfortable with sponsored content or affiliate links or any of that kind of stuff. And some people even put PR into that sort of bucket because you ha they haven't earned trust back, right? The, the trust hasn't been fully recovered inside of the YouTube beauty space. It's still too close. 
So I acknowledge that feeling and because I felt it myself. But I also, on the flip side, feel like there are certain people that I've built an affinity to um, just from watching them, people who I've gotten to know, people who I trust their opinions and thoughts on. And when I see them do a sponsored post or I see them take an affiliate link for a particular product, I don't get that icky, slimy feeling because I feel like they've always been authentic and transparent for me. So I think there is a caveat to that to say some people are never going to like sponsored content regardless of anything or affiliate links regardless of anything. For me personally, I think that there is a way to do it authentically. In fact, there's been a few channels where all of a sudden I will see them get sponsored by someone and I'll be like, yay, that is amazing. A brand is recognizing what I've seen all along. Like that's my first reaction is not, oh gosh, sponsored content, but my first reaction because I've gotten to know them, because I'm vested, I feel like personally in them, I see that sponsored content and the hashtag ad on their Instagram or YouTube page. And I'm like, oh my goodness, congratulations. That is so cool. And I feel like it's almost like a validation of something I already deep down knew, which was that they were awesome and now another brand is realizing they're awesome too. So I see both sides of it. I felt both sides of it. And I think it's something that is important to keep talking about. And I appreciate those channels as well that really lean into that topic and that conversation, who do channel updates and talk about their uh, relationships with PR and sponsored content and affiliate links and, and put it out there specifically and deliberately and then re-reference it so that new subscribers know that. Like, I think if you want to go down that path as a YouTuber, you have to be willing to lean into that conversation and to be very transparent about how this is all going down, or you do risk losing or alienating part of your base. So so we've just gone down a massive rabbit hole. Let's pull it back and move on to the next comment. Okay, so Natural Head One says, unpopular opinion, but oh well, give me all the scents in makeup and skincare. I love beautifully scented beauty products. Not cloying, over sweet fragrance, however. I don't have skin sensitive I don't have sensitive skin though, so makes a difference. So that is funny because listen, clearly the scented makeup was working because then everyone and their mother started scenting their makeup. And so obviously, although you are now uh, kind of seeing that this is maybe an unpopular opinion and people are griping about scented makeup and fragrance bothering their skin or just not liking the scented makeup, there was clearly a huge mass of people who must have really liked scented makeup because it exploded and so many people and so many different brands rather were doing it. For me, scents are just a tricky thing because I feel like for, and I'm just making this up, but I feel like for as many people enjoy them, I feel like there's an equal number of people who maybe don't, right? I may love the scent of coconut. You may hate the scent of coconut. I may hate the scent of peach. You may love the scent of peach and vice versa. But I'm not gonna lie, like I really like the watermelon glow face mask from Glow Recipe in large part because it smells like watermelon and it's lovely. And I don't mind opening up a nude palette with a whole bunch of browns and it's smelling like chocolate. And my butter bronzer continues to bring me joy because the first time I used that was actually on a tropical vacation at a resort. And so I not only, you know, love the scent of the coconuts in general, but it takes me back to actually being somewhere tropical at the first time I used it. But I do feel like uh, fragrance is one of those things that uh, is definitely very dividing as far as the subject goes. Veronica R uh, says, and hi Veronica, I always see you commenting, so hi. Um, she says, I think the following brands are super boring and I never buy anything from them. Revlon, Almay, Neutrogena, Clinique, Estee Lauder, Lancome, Bobbi Brown. I'm sure they have a loyal following, but it's not coming from me. Uh, it's really funny. Um, I think Emily was laughingly uh, calling uh, some or someone had laughingly called some of those brands like old lady brands. And I don't necessarily or like old lady makeup on one of Emily's videos. And I don't necessarily think that is the case. Um, but I also think that 
you're naming a lot of brands in which not a lot of innovation has taken place. And so I think what happens with a lot of these brands is that they've kind of rested on their laurels. They're slower to release products. They're also a little more set in their ways, less likely to take a risk in a particular direction. And I feel like they've become very basic as a result. They're great quality products probably from a lot of these brands. But it's so funny, uh, Revlon used to be the brand that I thought was the coolest at the drugstore. That was the brand I wore all through high school. I remember they had Shania Twain and Ashley Judd and a few other, oh, and Cindy Crawford as models. I'm dating myself here. Um, in the 90, late 90s when I was in high school and uh, I thought all the Revlon releases were just like amazing. They were like life changing for me when they came out with like pastel purples and violets. I was like, what is this? And I remember then they came out with this whole raisin collection and it was like rusty raisiny colored brown eyeshadow and lipstick and blushes. And I was like, oh. and, and so I remember Revlon like leading the color charge back in the day. Like they were the ones who were setting the tone for so many different styles of makeup um, towards the late 90s. And then I felt like they just fell off the edge of the planet. So I don't disagree. I think all the brands you've named here are just ones that are less innovative and are more basic. A number of you guys were commenting on the lack of olive green foundations. Um, T Max says, main thing that bugs me is it's 2019 and why isn't there more olive green foundations for warm and cool undertones? Um, I'm not pink, yellow, or neutral. I can wear some neutral shades, but a lot wash me out. Green girls need love too. And she commented um, a second time and basically saying, when Pure released their foundations with 100 shades and different undertones and still no olive green, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And a number of you guys were then commenting similar. So it's funny, there must be something just very challenging about formulating for olive skin tones. And I would love to see someone who really understands tone and really understands um, not only tone in terms of mixing colors, but tone in terms of skin tone. And it's probably a makeup artist come on board and just like offer up his services as like, I'm the olive skin tone expert. Everybody hire me as a consultant. I will get your olive shade right because given the like rash of comments I saw, a lot of you guys are struggling with this. Um, and I think we should be able to solve it. Like if we can put out a hundred different shades of foundation, we can come up with a few olive shades in the process. Uh, Maria Dentino says, I wish more brands would use removable magnetic pans in their palettes. I like being able to put together my own palettes and don't want to have to duplicate shades in my collection. Yes, I love this idea. I really wish more eyeshadows were not glued in and were actually just little magnetized in. I am um, giving a little bit away. I went and bought this little tool on Amazon. It will probably be in my favorites next month, by the way. Um, but it's like a magnet tool. It, I think it's meant for like uh, cars and like, uh, or reaching places where like screws are stuck because it's like telescopic. But anyway, this is a very strong little magnet and I did it specifically because I wanted to pull out the eyeshadows in my Sydney Grace Autumn Rain palette and just put them with all the rest of my single shadows. And what I realized was that um, they were magnetic. So this has a magnetic back in the bottom there. And this little tool is like fantastic at pulling them out. And so I went absolutely nuts uh, trying to figure out what are other palettes in my collection that are magnetized that way. I think I went, I opened up just about every uh, brand's worth of makeup with this little tool and was like <coughs> trying to figure out which ones were magnetized and which ones weren't. I completely agree because I think that allows us to mix and match, make our own palettes, come up with new color combos. This little piggy says, says, my unpopular opinion is that I preferred YouTube before the age of ring lights, filters, PR, and influencers. Give me an old school video filmed on someone's phone, hanging out in their bedroom while they talked about their life, their makeup, and how to use it. You know, it's funny. I feel like I was a little later to YouTube than a lot of people, mostly because, um, so when I was in my 20s, I was like obsessive about my career. I spent an obnoxious amount of time and energy on my job and then my marriage as well. Like I, I literally felt like I had time for my job a tiny bit for my 
my husband and a little bit for my dogs and then I was tapped out, right? So there was a huge part of my 20s when I think YouTube was kind of in that stage where I wasn't watching YouTube at all because I just didn't have the time and I didn't make the time. And, and it's funny, I got to a point in my late 20s, probably early 30s, where all of a sudden I realized like, I can grow this big career, I can do all these big things. Is that really what I want to do? Is that really where I want all of my energy and soul to be poured? Do I really want my world to be so one dimensional? And I kind of came to the decision that like, no, I don't. Like, I need to prioritize my time differently. I want to give myself time to have other passions in life, you know, to explore things that I'm interested in that are just always taken a back burner to me. I want to get back into reading more. I it was I've been an avid reader my whole life and that kind of went by the wayside. I wanted to give myself time to breathe and relax and do things and so I I I, I really deliberately made changes in my 30s to be able to explore other passions in my life besides my job. My job is still a passion for me. What I do and what I um, can spend my time on from a work perspective is still a passion of mine, but I want a balance. And so what's interesting is makeup's always been a love of mine. I've loved it since high school. I still loved it even during that crazy intense time I described in my 20s. I was still playing around with makeup every single morning and trying new looks and I never wore the same makeup. But I realized it, that I wanted to learn new techniques and play around with color differently. And so I started re reading or looking for, for tutorials and information and kind of went down this rabbit trail of YouTube probably about... Mm, eight years ago at this point. I would say it's about eight years ago. So I definitely feel like in the eight years that I've been actively watching YouTube that I have noticed a change, but I don't know as if I feel this dramatic change the way that a lot of people who have been on YouTube for like 15 plus years really do who are remembering it from the very beginning and some of these very early influencers. I was never really there. And so for me, I don't have that same sort of connection that I think a lot of other people do to this. It used to be this and now it's this and I don't like it as much as I used to, etc. cetera. So um, I do think that as we build content, as content creators, I think we've gotta be mindful about the fact that what makes us relatable and approachable and, you know, the, the beauty of YouTube is that it's different than any other medium out there, right? I'm sitting in front of a camera, but in it feels like I'm talking to you. It feels like I am, or I'm attempting to rather, communicate through this device to you on the other side and bridge the gap between us, even though we may never meet. And I think that that authenticity and that sort of not overly commercialized, not overly produced sort of content is real and authentic, but I also feel like you can do that in a polished way, right? So I do film with lights. I've deliberately learned a lot about cameras in order to try and um, put out videos that are clear, that are the color is as good as I can make it, as accurate as I can make it. I don't want my films to be super washed out, but I still want you guys to be able to see things. I want tone and undertone to be as correct as possible. And so I do think that there is a way to still be authentic and having conversations and be more casual and invite you into my house and my life and still do it with equipment that allows you a pleasant and nice viewing experience. I don't think those things are mutually exclusive of one another, but I also, I'm not gonna lie, I find the whole editing and cinematography filmmaking side of YouTube to be really interesting. And it's a creative outlet for a lot of people to learn that kind of stuff. So I, I guess I think as with many things, there's a balance. Helpful and Happy said, here's my new YouTube pet peeve. Video editing so tight that they're almost talking over themselves. They cut out and piece it together so closely and humans just don't talk that way. And it's popular YouTubers too. Um, <laughs> so here's the interesting thing about editing yourself. You catch every idiosyncrasy, every weird breath you make, every random um, 
every time you say like 50 times in a video or certain catchphrases that are part of our vocabulary that we overuse as you com we communicate. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Part of my role used to be I was a speech, I did speech writing for um, executives at my company. And so I would help develop their speeches and their presentations for a lot of different facets. And so one of the things that I would do when we were rehearsing what they were going to be presenting in whatever area it was, is I would sit back and listen and I would give them notes. They would run through their presentation and I would give them, you know, feedback on their presentation and their notes. Okay, be aware that you're constantly doing this on stage. Or I had a one presenter who was constantly like scratching her arm as she talked. Be aware of the things that you do that are repetitive or slightly strange or constantly using words in your vocabulary. But here's the thing. I sat on the opposite side of that and gave feedback to people for many, many, many years. And now uh, doing this channel and being an editor of my own content, I see those things in myself and I'm like, oh, stop saying that. How many times did you say um in that video? How many times did you have that like weird freaking pause? And then the other side of things is, at least on my end, and I'm speaking obviously as a, uh, for myself here, but I also have two very barky dogs, so I'm constantly editing out barks or pausing for barking, etc. And so for me, going into the editing process, it's hard sometimes to know whether or not to leave that in or take it out. When you catch yourself saying the same phrase 10 times in a video, the flow of that may feel a little more authentic in terms of how people talk and speech patterns if you were to leave it in. But I also feel like a lot of people would completely notice that and it would become annoying and repetitive. So what I do, and I think a lot of other people do, is start to edit some of those out, right? We zoom in really close on that audio file and we find those points where we said that phrase and we clip them out and we take them out and swish them back together. And you'll definitely notice in my videos, if you pay attention, you will see that like quick cut where it's like I was kind of over here and now I'm slightly over here. And that's usually because I've cut out dog barking or some stupid phrase or I, or I completely lost my train of thought or I sneezed or something else has happened, right? And so the challenge is you can over edit yourself and you can go through and watch your content and watch your clips through four or five times over and every time just like get really minute and really minuscule and really like start to get in your own head about that kind of stuff. And I think that happens a lot of times for people who edit their videos and then rewatch them and then rewatch them and rewatch them and edit them. And I, what I've learned about myself is that Unless my video has just gotten a lot longer than I really wanted to put out there and I'm looking for places to cut my content down, uh, which doesn't happen a lot, let's be clear, and this probably won't be the video in which that happens either. This is probably going to be an hour long. But when I do a first pass through, I try and be very aware of the flow and very aware of cutting things out that are not helpful inside of the video and making a clean pass of it. I very rarely go back and rewatch myself again because when I go back through a second time, that's when I start to find myself being more harsh with my editing, more clipped with trying to cut things out that I just don't like how I said it or I don't really care how that phrase came out or I ummed too much here. I find myself being a lot more critical and making a lot more of those cuts when I do that. So for me, and maybe this is just a good uh, tip for any content creator out there, is to just let your content come through authentically, do your first pass, and then just let it go. No one is perfect. If I'm having a conversation with you in real life, I will be all over the place and I will have to tangent back and I will and I will awe and I will lose my train of thought. And part of, like I said, this makes this medium so great is that sort of authentic platform to just be ourselves and communicate. So I do think there's a tendency at times to go too far with it though. And I see it out there too. Lucinda Robinson says, hi Lucinda. Uh, I wonder if brands watch declutter videos. That's hilarious. I wonder if they do too. They probably don't because they probably only care about how people are talking about their newest releases. Uh, that would 
that's probably all they watch out here, but I could be wrong. Um, she also says, I get that they send YouTubers products for visibility, but how about also treating loyal customers? You know, that's a really great point. And I think it's something that brands should really think about is that, you know, they're oftentimes PRing the heck and, you know, incentivizing the heck out of influencers out on YouTube. And I think they could do more to give back through giveaways or get creative, find ways to connect with your actual consumer base and give back to them. I think there's something there and I, I'm not entirely sure what that looks like practically. I mean, giveaways is the thing that comes to mind uh, instantaneously, but I feel like there's gotta be a way to do that and connect differently with the people who are buying the bulk of your stuff. It's a good call out. Graciela Provost says, I hate when I can't see the actual texture of someone's skin because I can't have realistic expectations when I try and use the same product. The ring lights already change colors and finishes so much and then people throw in filters, etc. I'm see here I'm here to see how products work for everyday regular people in normal circumstances. Yeah, I, I, I get that. So I have my ring light set pretty far back and down pretty low. I also have two soft boxes off to the side here just to kind of counterbalance the light because if I just, I feel like if I have just ring light straight on, it really changes the dimension of my face. So I, I sit in front of three lights, which can feel pretty extreme. I watch two things very closely. So on my personal camera, there is a point where my camera says, this is good light exposure. This exposure is not overexposed nor is it underexposed and I can see that midpoint there and hovers at a zero if it's overexposed it's like plus one two or three I mean if it's plus three let me just show you so right now I am sitting at perfectly zero let me show you what happens if I overexpose I'm going to turn my lights up real fast and then sit back down okay so I have all my lights up right now I'm blind, let's be clear. Um, where I was sitting at an even zero exposure, so perfect, I am now at almost plus one and a half heading towards two. So my skin probably looks pretty flawless. I bet my skin on camera when I go back and edit this looks buttery smooth and perfectly well, well, practically perfect. This is a challenge. In fact, I've got to turn these lights down because I can't do this anymore. Hold, please. All right, so now we're back to decent levels. So here's the thing with lighting, and this is a little bit of camera nerding, is that I had to go get a lens that had a very low f-stop. That camera with a lower f-stop, basically a lens that lets in more light can handle lower light situations better, allows me not to have to blast lights at their full crazy levels in order to make my camera function properly. And as a result, I think that shift in this, buying this lens made a big difference, but that was a decent purchase for me. That was hundreds and hundreds of dollars for me to get a lens that allowed me to do that. So oftentimes I think what happens is people are filming with kit lenses and basic camera settings and trying to figure out camera settings because they've never learned any of that before. They know they need lighting. They know they don't want to seem super washed out and they flip everything on and they look in the viewfinder and they think, oh, I look great. I think unfortunately what happens is that a lot of people are super passionate about makeup and just haven't learned about cameras and camera settings because it can be really complicated and really confusing and even I am not an expert. And I I feel like I've studied a ton of on this and I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of photography and videography. So I do agree. I watch videos and I see overexposure and I see like everything feeling super washed out and blown out. And I'm always like, oh, pull back the exposure. You can fix that in editing too. And I do wish there were more videos out there for especially beauty people on how to set things up because it was hard for me to learn all of this and it was a lot of trial and error. When you go back and look at some of my earlier videos, my lighting was just like all over the freaking place. My camera settings, I was messing with everything. Some of my, the video quality and those lighting in those early videos is just like mind-boggling bad. You couldn't see my skin or my face to 
at all. So I do think there's a learning curve that can be challenging to get past as you go to film. But I also agree with you that it's important that people be able to see skin. And it's important that you, if you're trying to show how a product works, that you get close up, that you make sure you're not overexposed so people can see your skin and your application. And I really do appreciate the channels that really work to master that so that I can really see what I'm looking at. Lori Looks says, my complaint is the community is a selling machine. No time to enjoy the new palette you just received because a new one just came out. Yes. Uh, I love get ready with me videos, shop my stash, declutters. If I feel like I'm watching an advertisement, I'm out. Glad your channel isn't like that. Thank you. I don't want it to be that. I don't want it to be this thing that just pumps out and makes you guys feel like you need to be buying things all of the time. I'm trying makeup. I like trying makeup. I like playing with new makeup. I like playing with old makeup. Like I just enjoy makeup in general. And so I want this to be about the love of makeup, not about the love of this new thing that you need to go buy right now. I, I And I think there's a balance to that. There's a balance for that in my life personally, as well as how I approach the, that on my channel. I've been really thinking about how to incorporate and how I want to leverage my collection in ways that I'm not now. And I been trying to do a lot of brainstorming behind the scenes. Nothing you guys will have seen to date, um, but I've been really thinking about, okay, what are the other kinds of content that I would really like to create that could leverage my collection, leverage things that I know and love uh, in a way that's not just that selling device? Because I agree, I don't want to just be sold on things. I want YouTube and, and the channels personally that I like following are ones where I feel like I'm just sitting there with a friend talking about makeup the way that I do with some of my friends. And so that's what I want my channel to be is a love of a conversation about makeup and beauty, not buy this new thing right now. Robin tis a bird. That's a cute name. Uh, says I'm getting bored of the proper way to make an eyeshadow look. I like shimmers in my crease and inner corner highlights make people's eyes look too close together. It makes tutorials way too predictable and boring. And please stop putting highlighter on the tip of your nose. It looks stupid. <laughs> okay, so um, I agree with you. I think that there are other eyeshadow techniques besides a matte in your crease, a matte in your outer corner, and a shimmer on your eyelid. You do not need to only use mattes in your crease. You can use shimmers in a zillion different ways. If you want to put a teal inner corner highlight and um, pink under your eyes, like there's creative ways to express and do eyeshadows besides the uh, standard way, I think, in which a lot of us have been taught. And part of what I find so fascinating about eyeshadow in particular, and I think it's why it's the thing that I'm drawn to the most, um, is this idea of how to combine colors and how to combine textures and how to make your eyes look dimensional. I 100% agree that there are rules that have almost been set up inside the community in terms of how you apply eyeshadow, and I would like to see those rules broken. Madison the Space Guitarist says, if you're like me and you have oily skin, you do not need highlighter, give me an hour, my whole face will be glowing to the gods. That is hilarious. Having just been in Phoenix when it was like 100 plus degrees, I totally get that. Like I don't have that problem when I'm sitting here in Yield, Ohio with normal humidity levels and temperatures in the 80s. Highlighter is a lovely thing for me. But when I was in Phoenix, all of a sudden my skin was glowing within an hour of just being outside. And I was like, who needs highlighter? My skin just did it itself. All right, I'm going to apologize in advance, but I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce your name because I will ruin it. Um, but she made a comment that said, not everyone is a fan of super fluffy eyebrows, super pigmented and foiled shadows, and disco ball highlighters. Some believe less is more and enjoy wearing minimal makeup. I agree. Um, I don't always want a super foiled eye. I've talked about that a lot. When I am doing more work appropriate looks, looks that are appropriate for the industry that I'm in, um, I typically tone it down. I love a good foiled shadow um, a lot of times, but some days I would much rather have a satin or something that has just a hint of shine as opposed to something super disco ball-y. And I feel like the risk of Ben lately is that we're confusing texture with pigmentation. And I feel like we've seen a lot of reviews talk about an eyeshadow not being pigmented or being a bad formula because it's not a foil. 
And a foil is a texture. A foil is a formulation. It has nothing to do with pigmentation. You can have an unpigmented foil and you can have an unpigmented satin eyeshadow. You can have a super pigmented satin eyeshadow and a super pigmented foiled eyeshadow. Pigmentation is the thing we should be talking about when we are dealing with eyeshadow reviews, in my opinion. And I feel like oftentimes we have switched gears to now think as a community that unless it's like foiled and wet looking, that it's an unattractive or somehow bad shimmer shadow. Super fluffy eyebrows. I I go back and forth. Like I, I feel like they look great on some people. When I get mine totally out of control, I just feel like I have caterpillars on my face. So I, I kind of go somewhere in the middle. I never liked that super sculpted, like stamped on Instagram brow that was super popular, but I haven't also been able to like swing myself to the extreme of like fluffy brows going every which way. I kind of sit somewhere in the middle and you guys probably see that on my channel but um and same with disco ball highlighters like i think they are fun in certain situations but in general I, and i've talked about this before i would like to make you question whether or not my skin is just naturally glowy and glossy looking or if I have a highlighter on, that is kind of been my makeup preference for a while now. And not to say that on a night out or from time to time, I won't, you know, go very shiny with a highlighter and it's clearly a highlighter. But like right now I have highlighter on, but I kind of feel like, can you, t my hope is that it looks like it's my skin, not a highlighter. I don't know. You guys may look at the footage and be like, no, that's clearly a highlighter. Uh, Victoria Hemingway says, large YouTubers that get mass amounts of PR and don't spend enough time testing products and are more likely to give poor recommendations, especially on f affordable products. I, I will admit I've unfollowed and or just don't watch. I may not have unfollowed, but I just don't watch some channels where I felt like that was happening, where I felt like there was constantly a review of a new product, constantly a review of a new thing. And there are certain things where I know that it takes longer to test. And, and maybe I'm a little bit crazy with really wanting to test, 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 test before I feel like I can give an authentic review. But I also feel like there was such a glut of PR coming to some people and such a glut of products that they were testing and reviewing that I always thought to myself, how have you properly reviewed this? I get the feeling this is the first time you have ever put this on your face. Or maybe you put this on your face for the first time yesterday in preparation for the video for today. And that's not what I'm looking for, I guess is what I would say. I would rather have a content creator talk about less products and do more in depth, really deep reviews on them than to have them review every single thing that comes out and give me very high level initial feelings on all the things. That's a personal preference. I know that some people really appreciate that certain channels always have an opinion and always have a review on something that's just launched and they keep up with all of the XYZ category thing here. I just, that's not my personal viewing preference and it's certainly not how I ever intended to run my channel. So I, I echo what you're saying here. Uh, Sarah Willen Nelson says, I don't enjoy all the PR and PR unboxing. I really think as honest as people try and be, the fear of losing free product as well as not spending their own money on products spins reviews in a more positive light. I've also found that most makeup I buy I think is fine, not bad. Nothing amazing or mind-blowing, just good. And I feel like a lot of reviews don't state this, which may tie back to PR. You know, it's an interesting point, and it's one of the things that I copied in from Samantha March. She basically takes everything she tried for a particular month and lumps it into three categories, stuff that failed her, stuff that was fine, and then stuff she really enjoyed, favorites, right? And, you know, it's interesting. I watch her, and the bulk of her stuff lands in that middle category. And I stole that idea for some of my sort of drugstore roundup as I was trying products in the spring and I owe you guys one for summer that I've got to finish filming. But this idea of let's put all the products that were duds into a pile. Let's cherry pick the things that really stood out to me and put them in the favorites pile. But I do think the bulk of makeup that is produced is just fine. It's fine. It's not great. It's not awful. It's functional but it's not like gas out loud, this is the best thing I've ever tried. It Most makeup doesn't fall into that 
category. Okay, I feel like I've missed some comments and if I missed your comment, I apologize. I was trying to get to the majority, if not all of your guys' comments in this video and I am really scared to go download this footage and see just how long it is because I have a sense that it is going to be well, we'll see how long this video is, um, but I hope you guys enjoyed the style of video. Let me know if you want to do more uh, conversational type things like this on my channel where you guys are giving me inputs or we're picking a subject and talking about it. And maybe it's a, maybe we pick some subjects and do chatty get readies with me and I show you guys some makeup that I've been loving and we talk about a subject while I do that. I don't know. I need to think about this idea, but I personally enjoyed filming this and talking about not just products, but concepts and things going on in the community and products from a 30,000 foot level as opposed to talking about a specific thing. I think this was a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. I look forward to chatting with you guys down in the comments because I think we're gonna continue this conversation down below. Hope you guys are having an amazing week. Bye.